Welcome to Savage and Average. I am your host, Matt McChesney. That is my co-host, Travis Jones, the man behind the microphone there producing this shit show that we call Savage and Average, but I sure do love it. Um, We've got a big show for you here today. Uh, The Gobble Gobble edition of Savage and Average coming to you from the lab down here at Six Year Football Academy and Mr. Jones' is home. Um, Happy Thanksgiving to everybody out there. I hope you have a safe and... uh, Plentiful Thanksgiving, to say the say the least, and uh, you know you're nice and full and fat. Watch football all day with your family. I, I know I can't wait. What's your favorite Thanksgiving food, big boy? Uh, I got something that's kind of good for you. So I like I like uh, green bean casserole, man. Look at you, uh, um, with the veggies, yeah, but not but, really. <laughs> but yeah, exactly right. Um, a good deep fried turkey is always good, you know. Uh, but nothing beats it when you top it off with a nice warm pecan pie, man. Oh yeah, yeah. What's your what's your pie of, of choice? Pecan pie, man. You're I a pecan pie guy. I, I don't mess with that pumpkin pie, man. I don't. Yeah, mess pumpkin with pie it. is disgusting. I agree. It's like <laughs> it's like uh, candy corn. Shit is gross. Yep. But yep. I, I, I'm a key lime pie guy. I love key lime. A few moments later. My favorite pie is key lime. <laughs> I love it. I think it's fantastic. Um, but I, I'm really big on the leftover turkey sandwiches, honestly. Like, I, all the meal is great, but when it's like 5 o'clock in the afternoon, 6 o'clock, and everyone's asleep or, like, laying down, my bad, my big ass is in the fucking kitchen, like, dicing up shit and fucking putting together a fat-ass sourdough turkey sandwich. <sighs> I can't wait. Hey, let me put you onto something. Mush sandwiches. So you a take, bush sandwich. You take your dinner roll. You open it up. You put some turkey, mashed potatoes, stuffing, a little bit of green bean casserole, top it off with some gravy, put that top back on it, and go to town, man. Oh, that's, 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 that's fucking happening. That's meal two and next day. Next day, <laughs> Meal leftovers. two and next day. Well, I can't wait. It's going to be a great Thursday of games uh, and all, also Gobble Gobble Day, which is always awesome. Uh, The day after Gobble Gobble Day was always special in my household uh, with half my family being Nebraska Cornhusker fans and half my family being Colorado fans for a long time, my entire childhood and young adult life. Uh, But that's now dead. Thanks a lot, college football. Uh, (laughs) Way to destroy the rivalries. That's awesome. Good job. And that's where we're going right off the bat. Uh, Colorado Center for Functional Medicine, uh, our great sponsor that does our protein here at 6-0 and does so much more for the guys. Their blood work paneling is outstanding. They bring us our college football segment here on Gobble Gobble Day. Matt McChesney here, and any of you that are looking to improve performance and get your health in check, reach out to our friends at the Colorado Center for Functional Medicine. Their men's health optimization plan is designed specifically for males that can identify specific health priorities which many doctors fail to address. They use precision blood work, which looks... At your hormones levels, your micronutrient levels, your insulin, and many other markers, which are often overlooked. This plan can also include an advanced body composition analysis to see where your body fat, your muscle mass, your visceral fat levels are at any order to establish individual nutrition plans for every single client. Stop relying on fad diets, crazy workout programs, and bro science. Health and fitness are not the same thing. If you want true results, they can help you at CCFM. Mention the podcast Savage and Average to receive a 10% a 10% discount on every single optimization plan, as well as a free body composition analysis and nutrition consultation. Their website is www.ccfuncmed.com. That's www.ccfuncmed.com. Or call them at 303-500-3038. And we roll. Call Ross Center for Functional Medicine. Thank you very much for all you do. All right, so T-Bone, let's go. College football, roll. All right, so the rankings came out last night, and a little bit of little bit of uh, turmoil because LSU jumps in that number five spot. Two loss for oh, shit. LSU jumps in that number five. Leapfrogs USC. USC fans are pretty upset about it, from what I'm, they I'm seeing be. online. But but here's the thing. Let me run down these rankings with you, and I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you 
of the two lost teams that are in there, I'm going to tell you who they lost to. So you got Georgia, Ohio State, Michigan, TCU, undefeated top four. Those guys are not going to move. There's not going to be movement in that top four, I don't think, until after this weekend. Um, And even so, I don't think there's going to still be movement after this weekend. Um, Then you've got on the two just outside, LSU at 9-2. and They lost to FSU and Tennessee. Then you've got USC at 10-1. and You've got Alabama, two-loss team, lost to Tennessee and LSU. Um, You've got Clemson at 10 and one, Oregon nine and two lost to Georgia and Washington. You've got Tennessee at nine and two lost to Georgia and South Carolina. And then you've got Penn state in that 11th spot chirping at nine and two lost to Michigan, Ohio state. Let me interesting note here. Penn state is the only two loss team that their two losses are both to teams that are in the top four. Every one of those nine and two teams have lost to at least one team that is outside of the top 15 or lower. You know what I hate about the college football playoff the most is all we do is talk about losses. We yeah. try and talk about good losses. There is no such thing as a good loss. It's a fucking loss. And I, I despise the fact that you can win or lose and still get in primarily. I hate it. The the play the Ohio State Michigan is a playoff game this weekend. Period. Just like it was last year, Georgia Alabama last year in the SEC title game should have been a playoff game. Neither they both shouldn't get in. Right. I just I can't I can't justify sitting here and saying like Penn State. If you want to play for the Natty, go beat Michigan and Ohio State. That's the way this works. Or move to the western part of the conference, which you can't do because you're on the East Coast. So yeah. you're fucked. So, like, yeah, you can have good losses. No, you can't. They're losses. You, that sucks. No one in the room feels good that they lost. I don't care if they were ranked first or 101st. Now, all that said, you seem to think that Ohio State and Michigan are both getting into the playoff. And that very, that very well may be. But if it happens and the playoff is Georgia, Michigan, Ohio State, a game we just fucking saw, and one of them is going to be at, at two and one of them is going to be at four, so Michigan's going to go out to play Georgia again, or Ohio State's going to have to play Georgia. And then Michigan or Ohio State is going to play TCU and USC with one loss doesn't get in as a, cha- as a conference champion. That is fucking ridiculous. It's well, ridiculous. I, think, I think that's what's got to be decided. If you're going to have a playoff, you have to have criteria or you're going to have all this subjectivity that's happening. If you're not going to say that co- a prerequisite is a conference title – and you're going to allow a, a Georgia Alabama, a, you know, a, a Georgia Al- a, or a Georgia LSU or a Georgia whoever from the SEC get in, then it has to be the same type of opportunity on the back end. Just because the SEC is having more of a season like the Big Ten and the Pac-12 in the Big 12 typically have where they eat off of each other throughout the season. You know, you don't have one to two big dogs and then all this other stuff you know, other things going on within the conference, you have, you have a conference that is tight between probably four, five teams up at the top in those other three conferences. And that's year in and year out. So if you're yeah, not going to, I, I understand. I just, I can't believe that they're still doing this. Yeah. Like they went from the subjectivity of bowl games and fucking number one playing number six and then anointing number one, the national champion because they voted on it, which was ridiculous. The BCS is the year I played in, and I was on a team that got totally fist-fucked out of the national championship and playing Miami in 01. And I, I'm not saying they weren't the best college football team I've ever seen, but I would have liked to get a crack at them. Um, and then now with this, this, you know, like the even the fact that TCU or USC even has to think about not being able to play for a national title after the seasons they're having, is a, it's almost disrespectful to the game, bro. And it, it, I think a one-loss Michigan or a one-loss Ohio State should be able to play for the national title. I think that Georgia and LSU should be able to play for the national title. Like, it, how about whoever's in the conference title games? Maybe they get into the playoff, except for the West Division champion. He can't get in. Um, <laughs> well, I, mean, I agree I think, that the criteria needs to change, bro, because I, I this, think- this shit is wearing me out. It's fucking wearing me out. I think out. If exp- expanding it is is the solution. I, if 12 teams is too much at the end of the year because it is a long college season, then no, I can't whatever. But, but you got to at least go to six. You have to anoint. 12. 
you got to, you got at a minimum, you have to go to six at a minimum. 12. I'm not saying going to 12, but at a minute, this 14 12. thing is crap because you have five conferences. 12. So at a minimum, you got to go to six. I like the 12 back. 12. I like the 12, <laughs> but I'm saying like, Right now, you can make the switch and not mess up anything contract wise. They, they could do twelve right now, and it would be a fucking badass playoff, bro. It would, but I think that that, that you're going to mess up a little bit what's going on because now you've got. I mean, you've got an extra weekend that you've got to put in there. You've got the you've got the you've got the New Year's Eve six right now. You've got to go to the next next week to play a second round and the third round plays on the 15th. I don't know if they're logistic wise. I don't know if they could do that, but this year, this year, you're true. Hey, look, what Detroit, just it, did, look what Detroit just did with Buffalo. So I'm going to, I'm going to put a squash to my own argument right now. Look what Detroit did for Buffalo. They tore down the carnival that was in there, put the field back together. Buffalo came in and played uh, uh, Cleveland. Uh, Cleveland. And, and, you know, it's going to stay in, it sounds like they're staying in Detroit and then they're playing tomorrow, you know, against Detroit. So I guess they can do it. Money is, money is the answer, I guess. It's and all, it's all money that, driven. They'll make more money betting. They'll make more money with ticket sales. Personally, I think that the first round of the playoff should be held at home stadiums. But can you imagine a fucking playoff game with like, and say USC is the fifth seed, USC hosts the 12th seed that is like USC hosts Penn State, or and then fucking the next game is, you know, Oregon and whoever the fuck. Like, it, I, I think it would be outstanding. So I really, really hope it happens. And the first four get buys, and then the, the next round is at sites. The next round's at sites, and you're rolling. And you'll probably end up with the same four fucking teams, but you know what? It's more games. It's more opportunity to bet, which I'm with. And, you know, I, I just I think that more college football is a good thing. And honestly, the more important you make these games, the less likely you get guys dropping out and not playing because there's no there's no football player on earth, regardless of how much money is at the end of the tunnel. that's going to look at his brothers and be like, I'm going to be really selfish right now and, and fall out of a playoff game off. You can fuck off with the San Francisco Bowl or the Insight Bowl or whatever, but the playoff that we just earned and busted our ass to get into i'm not walking away from that shit i want to ring yep. so you know I, I think that there's hopefully they expand this sooner than later because i watching the same four teams over and over and over again is driving me fucking crazy so real quick before we move on to uh what's going on in the coaching world if we end up with you know you're gonna have end up with georgia undefeated going into this you've got either ohio state or michigan undefeated going into this tcu's probably going to be undefeated going into this now you've got you've got either ohio state michigan with a one loss and that loss coming to a two or three you've got uh you got usc with one loss you got, got clemson with one loss and then you've got lsu with two losses and alabama with two losses i think that's where the the fourth team is going to come that the pool of that fourth team who do you yeah, think, I think is better? And if it's a, what did you do for me now yeah, I think Alabama's fucked. They're probably out on the outside looking in regardless. LSU, if they don't beat Georgia in the SEC title game, they're screwed. But if they do win, they're in. They're getting in. They'll be the Well, they should be in. Team. If they beat Georgia in yeah. the SEC title game, they like earned it, to be in. Essentially, if LSU beats Georgia, you could be looking at a scenario where you have LSU, Georgia, Ohio State, and Michigan in the playoff. Well, and I think, an undefeated TCU, I think that's the best. Big 12 champion, and a one-loss USC Pac-12 champion after beating Notre Dame and fucking the Pac-12 title game in back-to-back -back weeks. And Notre Dame's ranked. All looking in. Yeah. And you've got an undefeated – like, if that <laughs> happens, I think I'm done with college football, bro. I'm going to have to, like, step back and reevaluate. A Big 12 champion that's undefeated doesn't get an opportunity to play for the national title? I'm sorry, but that's fucking not, not cool. Like when I was in college in 04, well, I've told this story. In 04, uh, when I was a senior, we played in the Big 12 title game against an undefeated Oklahoma, and they killed us. It was Oklahoma's undefeated, USC was undefeated, Auburn was undefeated at number three, and Utah was undefeated at number four. And Auburn won the SEC, beat Tennessee in the title game, and got snuffed and didn't play for the national title. An undefeated SEC champion. That was the moment where I was like, the BCS is 
Like, I, I was in a situation where I got fucked, and now I'm watching an undefeated conference champion from the SEC get fucked. This is not cool. So, I'm sorry, bro, but I just, I can't, I can't wrap my head around this. I'm not saying that they're not the best four teams. I would probably take Michigan or Ohio State over SC or TCU in, in every regard. I'd probably take LSU and, and Georgia over those two teams as well. But it's about earning it. Yep. This is about earning the opportunity. An undefeated Big 12 champion fucking earned that. You can't fucking keep them out. You can't do it. But they will. <laughs> They'll fuck them. Watch. All right, moving on. Yeah, let's What's transition to, to, to the head coach carousel. <laughs> So a um, couple of things that have happened uh, recently. Um, obviously, we've looked at uh, Wisconsin and Leonard. They're, they're going to take the interim off, it sounds like, and, and keep him around. But two names that have been out there um, are, are, are off the table, I think, uh, as far as moving elsewhere. So you've got, uh, uh, you've got uh, signing extensions is Leopold, new contract extension in Kansas. And you've got uh, DeBauer Smart. in uh, in Washington also signed an extension. Two Smart. names that have been pushing pushing out in other programs, specifically Nebraska. Um, so uh, those Don't two names, I think those two t- names are off the table. Um, you know, you've got uh, so I guess it, it's Dillingham has been uh, linked to going to uh, ASU, the OC out of Oregon, and then you've got CU. And there's there's a lot of names thrown out there. I'm going to go down this list of names on the different major out major uh, major outlets I'm that are out there. I'm high stepping in my office right now. I'm high stepping. <laughs> Come on, Brian. Come on, Brian. Come on, baby. Come on, Brian. <laughs> Forty-five midfield down the sideline. Only Christie can catch him. He's on his way for a touchdown. Neon Dion saluting as he goes. Wouldn't you know? He'd find a way. <laughs> <laughs> so you got here's the names that are being mentioned out there, and and I've and I've heard that we are close to a decision um, that's coming out of there, and you can give some more insight into that, Matt. But Ryan Walters, Brian Harson, Tom Herman, Bronco Mendenhall, Troy Taylor, Gary Patterson, and you, like you said, Dion Primetime uh, Sanders, and he's getting some big big backing from alum. You've come out and said that that would be big, Dave Bacteria. Oh uh, you know. Uh, Dave Bacteria came out and said, you know, that would be he would bring the juice that's needed up there in Boulder. So uh, give us give us some insight there and what you think is going on to see you. And then we could cover so the other. I, I personally think it's a two man race. And I'm not saying that based on what is actually happening. I know the I know the people behind the scenes. I've talked I have talked to them pretty much every day about this. They're you know, they're not telling me the names they're just telling me they're close because you know it, it's good to keep things to the best you don't even want to tell your best friend that's fine i don't want to know uh it would be hard for me to sit here and not be bursting at the seams to be honest with you but if i had to pick okay i would say either dion is the clear choice number one because of name recognition what he's done at jackson state the fact that he's bringing in his son to play quarterback on top of the, the unbelievable two-way receiver corner kid that they have over there who is a first-round draft pick. His name's Travis Hunter, right? Yeah. Yeah, that kid's a fucking animal, plus just the amount of kids around the country that will gravitate towards him at, in Boulder. Anybody who thinks that they can't turn things around really fast in Boulder, you obviously haven't been paying attention to college football and what's going on right now, but the transfer portal can change things really, really fast. I'm about to be on Coach JB's show after this, and he hates the transfer portal. And I'm not the biggest fan of it, but I also think that it has use. And if you're a graduate transfer like Elijah Anderson Taylor, who just led the big sky in tackles and led the country in TFLs and forced fumbles up there at middle linebacker, and his tape is so out, his tape is fucking outstanding. I'm going to post it later. It is outstanding. And he, you know, I remember like beating Colorado's door down, trying to get him to recruit this kid. Originally, he went to Eagle Crest with Jake Wiley, who's the starting right tackle at CU. And not only that, but he went to Eagle Crest with Bear Miller, who's at Stanford, and Braden Miller, who's at Michigan State. Jake's at CU. Reese is at fucking Michigan with your son, Connor. Shay Owen Depot's at Boise State. Max Marsh is at fucking Kansas State. Weatherby's at Texas Tech. And they just keep rolling, right? Mm-hmm. So, and I'm sure I forgot somebody. So it's 
this long line of Eagle Crest guys, and he was another one, and they wouldn't take him because he's 5'11". Well, that 5'11 is a bad motherfucker running sideline to sideline, and now he's got two more years, and as a graduate transfer, if I'm a coach around the country and I've got a guy who had 111 tackles and was just a monster, what? how do I get you on the field? Like, how do I get you in the program immediately? So I've already talked to several schools about him, including Boulder, but Boulder's in such a transition phase right now that they're like hands are tied. They can't offer guys at the moment. They can't bring it. They can't bring it transfers because they don't know who's going to be there and who's not. I want either Dion or Ryan Walters. I played with Ryan at CU. Uh, he's a great friend of mine. He's an unbelievable defensive coordinator. And personally, I think Walters might be the better fit because this is his alma mater. I think he would stay here forever. He's only 37. I don't think he would jump jobs. My only fear about Dion is that he will. He will jump the job immediately. Like if Florida State ever opens, although my man Mike Norvell down there is balling and they're doing really well. If they have a bad year next year, there's the the fucking the pipes are going to be ringing for Dion to come home. So I don't want him to come in here and Mel Tucker us. I can't be mad at him if he does because we've got to know it can happen. Right. But Ryan Walters is the safe play if you want to go first time head coach. The other guys that you said the retreads, I'm not interested. I don't want some boring ass old white dude up there again. I'm sorry, I can't do it. And I, I don't care if all you boring ass old white people don't like that. My cracker ass can say whatever I want. I personally think that having a having a black head coach is a massive advantage in Boulder if it's the right guy. And Dion is personable and has a huge personality. Everyone knows him. There was an Aflac commercial last night playing during the Nugget game with him and Nick Saban. And my son, my nine-year-old, was like, oh, look, is that the next coach at CU? And I was like, that's what the fuck we're looking for right there. That's Dion. Absolutely, that could be the next coach. So... From a recruiting standpoint and from a, just a program building standpoint, the guys he's going to bring in as assistants, I think Dion would be a fucking grand slam. But the safe bet is Ryan Walters. He's an unbelievable defensive coach. He'll bring the defense back to Boulder, which is something they're lacking bad. People will want to transfer here. He develops the shit out of DBs. That Witherspoon cat they have at, at, uh, at Illinois was a, no stars. Last guy recruited in the recruiting class. Everybody thought he couldn't play, and now he's a first-rounder. So Walters and, and Bielema over there, they see a lot of talent where other people don't, which is pretty much what Colorado is. You have to have fucking binoculars on and binoculars, as they say in England, and you've got to be able to look and identify talent and find it and, and recruit it. You know, like the big freshman tackle at Ballard last night, Brett Kudja, got fucking Penn State. You know, so I thought freshmen couldn't get offered. What happened? Oh, they get offered at 6-0, just not around here, but they get offered here. So now he's got CU and Penn State. CU saw that first. They offered him first. They're going to have a legitimate chance to recruit him. They offered Lincoln first. They'll have a legitimate chance to recruit him, Stonebreaker. Consequently, go full circle, not to bring up shit that hurts, but you're Colorado, like born and bred almost, damn near. You're from you're from Ohio, but your boys are from here, right? Yep. Right? Yep. And your son was a fucking All-American and – everything you could achieve and they didn't need and in my program for four years you worked for me for god's sakes work with me and they didn't even fucking recruit him or offer him and he's good enough to play in michigan for the fucking number three ranked team in the country and the best offensive line in the country but he can't play in boulder so like that can't happen i don't care if you don't think you can get them that's a loser attitude you got to attack every kid and try to get them so those are the two names that I want. All look, the other coaches, if they go the Harson route or the Gary Patterson route, or God forbid they hire Brocko Mendenhall, please fucking don't hire Brocko Mendenhall. Uh, I, I don't need some super conservative, tight ass white dude up there running this program right now. I, I need somebody with some flair and some swag that can relate to these kids, that has a social media account, that understands how to hit send. Like, I don't need somebody's grandpa up there talking shit about what used to be back at BYU and Boise. I get just wrong. No, please, God, don't hire Bronco <laughs> Mendenhall. Um, not saying he couldn't do a good job. It's just not what we're looking for. Yeah. We need to go another direction, bro. We, we just got done employing a coach that couldn't figure out how to use a cell phone and was really lazy and looked at it like it was the lotto. Carl Durrell was like, fuck this. I got a job and I get $20 million over three years if we win or, or lose. Who gives a shit? And he didn't recruit. He didn't do shit. So I need a, I need an exuberant coach that's going to do the job. 
period. And I know Ryan Walters will do it. And I think that Prime will come in here and do a really good job. I just don't see him allowing himself to be associated with something that sucks. I'll tell you what, here, here's what I think will happen. If Dion gets the job and comes up to Boulder, one of two things is going to happen. It's going to open up, and CU's going to get back up to a you know a top twenty five recognizable team. Or Dion is going to expose what a lot of people close to Boulder have been saying Already for know. years, and that that program is stifled by the the leadership and in the processes and procedures and all this other stuff that you hear about and we talk so, about. So I'm glad you brought that, that up, and it's going to bring it to a surface. To, to be I'm able to, to be able to, I, I others. obviously haven't talked to prime time about this. I don't know Dion personally. Although Jackson State did just offer Jordan Achoa, the big defensive end at Castleview the other day. So Jordan gets his first two offers after funny, he goes on a recruiting trip to Alabama and posts and exposes it. And two days later, FAU and Jackson State both offer him full rides. Hmm. The power of social media and being productive with your own ass. Good Market job, Jordan. Yourself. Thank you very much. That's marketing um, But yourself. I will say this. I don't know Prime personally, but I know Walters well. He's a, he's a brother and an ex-teammate and a guy who I really, really respect. And I have told him on the phone several times, do not even think about taking this job unless you fucking grill them about all these problems. All you're doing is setting yourself up for failure. And no one's going to care that they like can't get their shit together up there. They're going to blame it on you. Mm-hmm. And some of the fans see the difference, but most of them just sit there and boo the coach. So if they're not going to, if they're not going to make transferring as easy as humanly possible, if they're not going to NIL you, if they're not going to allow you to bring in anybody and everybody you want to, I don't give a fuck about their past. I don't care about the grades. None of that shit. This is professional football now, guys. Everybody needs to stop with the character shit. I need fucking ball players. I would rather reform a bunch of kids than recruit them, i.e. exactly what Gary Barnett did with all the guys that went to school like me. He reformed me and turned me into a functioning fucking member of society rather than being in a cage right now, you know, trying to fucking get a shiv going on the floor to protect myself. You know what I'm talking about. So reforming, guys, is the key to success. Not everybody on Michigan and Ohio State's roster are choir boys, are they? Are those a bunch of choir boys or are those a bunch of bad motherfuckers? Probably not. Yeah, bad motherfuckers, <laughs> dogs. dog. They ain't playing around. So they want to get paid, and they want to go play, and this is the way to do it. So Ryan Walters or Dion, Dion's first just for, for just to be fucking as selfish as possible. But Ryan Walters is the one. Just ring that bell, baby. If Ryan Walters is the next head coach in Boulder, I'm going to be doing fucking jumping jacks on the way up there to meet with my boy. So that that's what I think will happen there. Uh, we got a lot to talk about here moving forward on uh, Savage and Average as we wrap up the next 10 minutes here before we get everybody out on Gobble Gobble Deck. And the, the NFL talk here as we move into the game days uh, or the games on Thursday are brought to you by our good friends at Rico's Burritos. Uh, Rico's Burritos feeds the Dungeon family here every day. We've got a bunch of them in the fridge over there right now. My boys love them. Uh, they literally live on them during the week at breakfast damn near every morning. Uh, and that's why Nick's getting so big, lifting in Rico's Burritos. Uh, but check out Rico's Burritos on all the social media platforms. They do an unbelievable job supporting the Dutch family on the show. And they're going to bring us our NFL talk as we wrap up the gobble gobble version of Savage and Average. This is Matt McChesney from Savage and Average, the owner and operator down here at Six Zero Football Academy. And I want to talk to you about our friends over at Rico's Burritos. Uh, the Rico Burritos keep me rolling on a daily basis. My sons eat them constantly. My, my 12-year-old over here is staring at me right now as he scarfs down. Uh, another one of these badass burritos from Rico's Burritos. It's a hearty 10-ounce breakfast burrito offered in eight different flavors, three delicious uh, breakfast combinations, five scrumptious lumps, lunch options, and the the pride that is taken in offering a high-end restaurant-quality burrito uh, is second to none. The finest ingredients you can find, authentic re- recipes that have been in the Garcia family for 30 years. Uh, Young Cruz is in the program over here working his ass off on a daily basis. Uh, Rick Garcia, his father played at Oregon State back in the day, and they they put the same passion and intensity that they have in every walk of life, and their training and chasing everything down that they want into their family business, Rico's Burritos. Uh, For over 30 years, the ingredients and flavors uh, have been identified as the best in the business, and the moment you bite into one of these unbelievably delicious burritos, you will know 
Uh, check it out. The website is www.ricosburritos.com. That's www.ricosburritos.com. And it'll give you all the locations, how to purchase the burritos, so on and so forth. On Facebook and Instagram, Facebook is at Rico's Burritos, and Instagram is Real Rico's Burritos. That is Rico's Burritos, a proud sponsor of Savage and Average over here at 6-0 Football Academy, and we are rolling. All right. So, let's go. Turkey Day football. What do we got? So, we've got uh, Buffalo at Detroit. We talked about that earlier a little bit. Uh, we've got Giants and Cowboys, and we've got New England and Minnesota. Minnesota. All right. So, Buffalo, Detroit, sneaky game. If you really want to go, if you want to bet some money and, like, earn some money this weekend, take take Detroit at home because they're going to score. Detroit's offense is outstanding. And Buffalo's going to score because Detroit's defense is not. So, take the over. And if you want – if you got big fucking turkey balls, if you got big balls on fucking – on on Thanksgiving Day, and you're sitting down, and you're like, "Hey, this is pre meal. I fasted all night. I'm ready to go. My stomach's empty. I'm gonna put fucking a hundred on Detroit to win in the over. Bam, get paid. That's what I'm doing. I'm taking Detroit in the over and a couple of touchdown scores. So, you know, and Buffalo's been there all week. I'm sure that they want to go home. I, I just wouldn't put it past Detroit and Dan Campbell. Watch for uh, bro. They're gonna bust out every trick play imaginable on Buffalo." Fake punts, kickoff reverses, whatever, fake field goals. They're going to do all kinds of crazy shit to win that game at home on Turkey Day. Who are you taking? Um, I'm taking Detroit as well. I, I really like what, what's going on. Uh, Dan Campbell got me ready to run through a wall on, on, uh, on a hard knocks. I love it. They had some adversity at the beginning of the season, but I think things are churning for them. They and, won three in I mean, a row, bro. They look good. Hey. Hey, they got my boy. They got my boy Hutch, and he is firing on all cylinders. Not he only is, is he balling. Hey, he is not just putting himself in the conversation for defensive rookie of the year. He's in the conversation for defensive player of the year. I agree. He's killing he got it. Three picks in the last three weeks. He's all over the field rushing the passer. I love that he plays the goddamn run game the way he does. He doesn't take run plays off. Uh, he 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 reminds me of a more athletic better put together Jared Allen, like a, a guy whose motor is just fucking all day, all along. So I, I really hope Detroit, I hope this is the foundation for them to pull out of it. My entire life and everyone's entire life, Detroit's been terrible. Even with guys like Megatron, Barry Sanders and fucking Matty Stafford, and they were still awful. So, you know, I remember the old Detroit days with Robert Porsche and, you know, fucking all those guys that, that they had on those teams. And they were okay. They got to the playoffs a couple of times. They made the NFC title game once and got waxed by the Redskins. Uh, but I, I hope Detroit can figure out a way to beat Buffalo. And I'm, I'm an AFC East Jet fan, so I need Buffalo to lose because the Jets have the the Manhattan Milf Hunter playing quarterback, and he's out slanging dick around all over Manhattan, <laughs> and he can't complete a goddamn pass to save his life. They need to bench this guy immediately. Get Joe Flacco on the field. Flacco's at home with one woman and eight kids. The Manhattan Milf Hunter's out here with 100 women. God knows how many kids. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who do you got between Giants and Cowboys? some Mormon off today. <laughs> <laughs> who do you got between the Giants and Cowboys? <laughs> <laughs> Giants and Cowboys, who you got? Giants, Cowboys. This is going to be a great game. I, I don't think anybody expected both of them to be 7-3 and three when the season started playing on Thanksgiving. I mean – most of the time, the Thanksgiving games suck. Like, they're, they're always, like, one good team, one shitty team, or two shitty teams. And all three of these games are fucking awesome. So, this could go a long way in determining who the wild card is out of that division. Uh, the Giants got waxed last week by Detroit. They, I think that some of their warts are starting to show. The, now, Dallas, on the other hand, put 40 fucking points on Minnesota and Minnesota. Kind of a hangover game after the Buffalo game for them. Um I'm going to take Dallas. I think they're just too good on offense. Dak is out there playing at a high level. Tony Pollard and Zeke seem to have their one-two together. Um, their defense is fucking nasty. Mm -hmm. Like, Parsons is nasty. Diggs is nasty. Uh, Lawrence has really come back after his injuries. Nasty. I, I think that they're a really good football team. And Jerry might have a team that can go make a run and make it to the Super Bowl this year. We'll see. But I'm going to take Dallas over the Giants. 
All right, and then we've got New England and Minnesota. Minnesota. New England and Minnesota on Turkey Day. I don't think Minnesota allows two games back-to-back to to go south. I think that they'll be ready to play on Thanksgiving. That said, if you underestimate a New England football team, they will beat the shit out of you. So you know that Bill Belichick's going to have his guys ready to play on national TV on Turkey Day, the last game of the night, Uh, especially with their big win last week against the Jets. Come on, puncher. Get a little bit more arc on that kick, please. Um, and, you know, winning 10-3 to 3 against your rival and then going on the road for Thanksgiving, if they can win these two games back-to-back, it sets them up to make a fucking run at the division. So the AFC East is really tight, and this game is re- these games are really important for Buffalo and New England, and they're sandwiching them in. So, you know, the, the stuffing and the turkey is, is Dallas and the Giants, and then you got the two other games as the bread. So... It, it's going to be a great day of NFL football and gobble gobble day, but I'll take uh, I'll take the Lions, the the Cowboys, and the Vikings uh, to win those three games. Awesome! And like so, here's here's the other part of it. All six of these teams are currently in if the playoffs ended today. It's crazy, That's, isn't it? That that is that is awesome. I don't think we've had. It's been a while since we've had Thanksgiving football. That that is this impactful to the big picture in the end of the season picture right now K- A- afc you've got kc at one miami at two titans at three ravens at four bills at five patriots at six and Bengals at seven they're going to move up they're not wow. going to stay at seven nfc you've got the eagles at one vikings at two san fran at three tampa at four cowboys at five giants at six uh seattle at seven look at the nfc east Jesus representing big time there. So yeah, it's going to be pretty, I, I it's like going to be pretty layout. awesome to see the rest of the season, how it plays out this next six weeks is going to be nuts. Six, seven weeks after uh, Thanksgiving or after Thanksgiving in, be- in between Christmas. And then the, the two weeks after new year, that's going to determine who's in and who's not. And you know, that's the beauty of the NFL. So, Hey, happy Thanksgiving to you and your family, brother. Uh, I will see you on Monday when we get back to the roll. Uh, go blue this weekend, obviously. Uh, it's a fucking big weekend for our boys. Go Blue! Reese Atterbury and Connor Jones up there. Dungeon Family's pulling for you. Art, go get a W. Beat Ohio State again. I want Connor and Re- I want Connor to walk out of there never losing to Ohio State. Walk around with big balls. Um, yeah, so that's going to be great. Enjoy football. Enjoy your families. Enjoy Thanksgiving. Be safe. Uh, and be thankful for uh, being an American, man. You could be in a fucking in a, in a ditch somewhere on the other side of the world and not enjoying Turkey. So, Hey, real quick, real quick, shout out to the high school, Colorado high school guys that are playing on Thanksgiving this weekend. Amen to that. They've earned that right. And a uh, big shout out to them. We got guys at Pine Creek Valor. We've got guys at uh, Palmer Ridge. We've got guys at uh, Broomfield, Broomfield Erie, Erie. D- Durango. Like they're all over the place. So Roosevelt, um, I think we got yeah. a guy almost on every team still playing. Yeah, absolutely. So big shout Pretty out to awesome. those guys that have earned the right to play on Thanksgiving. That's a big deal. Yep. Thank you for everything you do, TJ. And uh, best of uh, best of uh, uh, holiday spirit to you and your family. And well, uh, we will be back next week on Savage and Average, boys. Happy Thanksgiving. God bless <laughs>